So today we are going to talk about afterlife in Christianity and more specifically, we are going to focus on medieval Catholicism. Uh, first, uh, I have to tell you some basic information about uh, Middle Ages in general, and that's where we are going to begin. Life in the Middle Ages. By the way, um, in this uh, image, what you see is one of the greatest kings, uh, the emperor of the uh, Holy Roman Empire, uh, the first king, the first Frankish king who was uh, crowned the emperor by the Pope, uh, whose name was Charles the Great or Charlemagne. Uh, he's on the left uh, riding a horse and on the right you see the Pope uh, who supposedly crowned him the king. That was a historical uh, moment, a historical episode uh, in Europe that took place in the year 800 of the Christian era. So we will be talking about this uh, later on. And now uh, we will begin with uh, some histori historical periodization of the Christian church. Um, religious scholars divide the history of the Christian church into three main periods. The first one is called the early or formative period uh, of the church. It lasted from the first century through the fourth century of the Christian era. The medieval period begins in the fifth century at, and runs for 1000 years through the 15th century. Now, why those particular centuries? Uh, first, to the early Christian church. It um, started obviously in the first century after the death and resurrection of Christ and the period of the early Christian church ended in the fourth century. Why the fourth century? By the end of the fourth century, Christianity became the state religion of the Roman Empire. In the first half of the um, fourth century, the Emperor Constantine or Constantine um, stopped the persecution of Christians by issuing a decree according to which Christians should not be persecuted in the Roman Empire. And uh, in the uh, second part of the fourth century, another emperor, the Emperor Theodosius, officially made Christianity the state religion of the Roman Empire. That marked um, a milestone in the history of the religion that started uh, as a persecuted sect in the empire and in the first four centuries was able to spiritually conquer um, the Roman Empire and to transform it from a pagan state into a Christian state. Now, the medieval period of the Christian church begins in the 5th century. Why the 5th century? In the 5th century, right after the triumph of Christianity, the western part of the Roman Empire was conquered by the barbarian tribes. Now, the barbarian tribes would later become the European nations. But back in, in the 5th century, they were the barbarians. And because of this event, um, we uh, mark the beginning of the medieval period of the Christian church um, from the 5th century. It ended in the 15th century because um, the, although the western part of the Roman Empire fell to the barbarians, the eastern part of the Roman Empire withstood the attacks uh, from uh, the external enemies and survived for one thousand more years. That eastern part of the Roman Empire was called the Byzantine Empire or Byzantium. Byzantium survived for 1000 years but in the year 1453 it was conquered by the Ottoman Turks uh, when uh, the capital city of the Byzantine Empire, Constantinople, the city of Constantine or Constantine, uh, fell to the Turks. So that event marked the end uh, of the medieval church. 
Uh, and the modern church begins with the Renaissance in Europe, 14th, 15th century, up until now. Now, let us consider life in the Middle Ages in terms of its economy, social structure, politics, and uh, the developments of the church. First, we'll begin with uh, the economy. Uh, medieval Europe um, was based on agriculture. In medieval Europe, peasants made 90% of all Europeans. Now, peasants, um, this is an umbrella war, word for um, people uh, who work on the field. Uh, but peasants uh, in the Middle Ages were of different kinds. Most of the peasants were serfs. Some of the peasants were farmers. So what is the difference between farmer and the peasant, peasant and a serf, serf and a slave? Now, serfs were peasants who were owned by the Lord, their master, the person who actually owned the land. Uh, so serfs were peasants who worked on the land of their Lord. They grew crops for the Lord and for themselves, and they paid a rent. Um, in in uh, response to the to their work, uh, the serfs were able to uh, have a house where they could live. Uh, they could uh, grow some crops for themselves, um, but uh, they had restricted rights. Unlike peasants, serfs were not allowed to move from one land to another. Peasants, on the other hand, were free people uh, who were working also for the Lord. Uh, the land was owned by the Lord, but peasants, unlike serfs, generally speaking, were able to move to another land. Uh, they could be educated. Uh, they could get married if they could afford it. And they could buy their own land if they have enough money. So if, let's say, some peasants uh, buy some land and started working for themselves, they would become farmers. So farmers are peasants who own their own land, their own farms, and who were working uh, on the fields or uh, who would use other peasants and serves um, to work for them. Now, most of the peasants in the Middle Ages were serfs and generally speaking peasants uh, were the poorest people in the middle ages but um, what was happening with medieval economy during this um, huge period of development we're talking about 1000 years was that um, uh, the peasants developed certain um, technological uh, novelties uh, that helped them uh, in their business. They developed a heavy plow, the key to Europe's future prosperity. The peasants used water wheels and later windmills to mill the grain. Um, they invented what uh, was uh, probably one of the greatest agricultural inventions in medieval Europe, the method of following. Uh, when you would leave some part of the soil fallow for a season, uh, to enrich it uh, so that you can grow more crops over the years. So all in all, uh, by um, the beginning of the 14th century, by the year 1300, um, medieval European agricultural productivity uh, was quite high uh, and Europe achieved uh, a certain level of wealth, uh, which was not surpassed for centuries. Now, let us say a couple of words about the social hierarchy. At the top of the medieval society would stand a king who would be elected from among various 
um, first chiefs of the tribes, uh, then from among various uh, rulers of smaller parts of the kingdom. Next to the kings would uh, go counts. Counts uh, were noble people who would own large portions of the land, counties. Uh, then dukes who would own uh, smaller portions of the uh, land, uh, but who would have their own authority over uh, their territories, duchies. Then the nobility of various status, knights, barons with counts. Uh, all of these guys were warriors uh, who uh, would ride on a horseback, uh, whose main uh, weapon would be the lance, um, and who would be ready to defend the king if the king uh, would ask them to defend the country. So when uh, a person receives a portion of the land, uh, he would have all the authority over people on this land. And for those people, he would be the Lord. But for the person higher in the hierarchy, he would be the vassal uh, who would have his responsibilities before the king. So hence, uh, when the king needs an army, he would call his vassals, dif different uh, noble people, nobility, uh, he would call them up and they would uh, uh, respond to the call and they would bring with them their own small armies. And that's how the army was mobilized in the Middle Ages. So overall, these interlocking arrangements between the lords and the serfs on the one hand, and the lords and their vassals on the other, are sometimes called the feudal system or feudalism. That's how scholars characterize um, the social and economic and political structure in the Middle Ages, feudalism. Please do not confuse it with family feud. Now let's talk more about politics. The first king, the first barbarian king, who united all the tribes, all the Frankish tribes under one ruler was called Clovis. Clovis uh, is a very important figure in medieval Christian Europe because he was also the first Frankish king who converted to Catholicism in the year 496. Um, the legend of Clovis's conversion uh, reminds us about the story of the conversion of the Emperor Constantine, uh, the uh, emperor of the Roman Empire that lived in the fourth century of the Christian era. According to the story of Constantine, um, he was about to fight his co-emperor, he wanted to unify the empire under his command, of course. And he saw the vision of uh, the cross uh, with the inscription in this conquer. And uh, after he was victorious in this fight, uh, he um, did not convert to Christianity, but he became very favorable to Christianity and he has done many great things for the new religion. Uh, he stopped the persecution of Christians in the year 313. He convened the first Christian council at Nicaea in the year 325 because he needed an ideological unification, not only the political unification, but also one united ideology. He has built many Christian churches. He gave uh, the Christian priests uh, some rights uh, to uh, decide uh, in civil matters, not only in religious matters. Uh, he um, established the capital of the eastern part of the empire, the city of Constantine, Constantinople. Uh, and he converted to Christianity, according to the story, only on his death bed. Uh, until his death, he also remained the high priest of the pagan religion. Now, the story of Clovis is kind of similar. 
Uh, first of all, um, according to the legend, uh, Clovis's wife was Christian. And um, while preparing uh, or while in the middle of one of the battles, Clovis uh, realized that his gods abandoned him and he turned to the God of his wife, to Jesus Christ. And after he was victorious, he converted to uh, Catholicism. There were different versions of Christianity back then. Uh, in Europe, he converted to Catholicism uh, and he became the first Frankish king to have done that. Uh, he became also the founder of the uh, first European dynasty, the Merovingian dynasty that ruled the kingdom for the next two centuries. Now to Charlemagne or Charles the Great, whom I mentioned in the beginning of my lecture. Charles the Great was another king of the Franks um, and the founder of another dynasty, the Carolingian dynasty. In this map, you see the Carolingian kingdom. But unlike Clovis, Charlemagne was not only the king, but he was also crowned emperor by the Catholic Pope in the year 800 of the Christian uh, era. Now that was uh, an event of utmost importance for Europe and for Europe's future. Uh, now, let me um, talk more about this uh, from the perspective of Islam. If you look at this map, you will see the spread of Islam uh, after the death of the Prophet Muhammad in the seventh century. Um, the spread that took place in the next um, 100, uh, and 20 years only. So by the uh, death of the Prophet Muhammad in 632, um, only that part of Arabia was unified by the Prophet. And after the Prophet, his successors, the so-called four righteous caliphs, were able to expand the empire only in 30 years into Egypt, into Northern Africa, into the Middle East. You know, the whole of the Palestine was conquered, including Jerusalem, into Syria, uh, into Persia. Persian empire back then wa was one of the two greatest empires uh, on the face of the earth, uh, the Persian empire and the Byzantine empire. So they conquered the whole of the Persian empire, moved uh, further to Afghanistan, uh, and that took place in 30 years. After the four righteous caliphs, uh, the first Muslim dynasty arose, the so-called Umayyad dynasty. Now the Umayyad dynasty ruled uh, the Muslim empire for 90 years. And in this 90 years, they were able to conquer the rest of the uh, Northern Africa and Spain. Uh, Muslims conquered Spain and then were trying to conquer Paris, but they were stopped at the Battle of Tours, retreated and um, left their attempts uh, to move further into uh, the European lands. They also extended their empire even further um, here in Asia. And they were constantly threatening uh, to conquer the Byzantine Empire. So um, the Catholic Pope and the King uh, of uh, the Barbarians were under a constant threat from the Muslim invasions. They were under the threat from the invasions from Spain. They were uh, under the threat of the invasion from or through the Byzantine Empire. So it, the, at this moment, uh, the Catholic Pope decided to um, rely on the king of the barbarians rather than the Byzantine emperor. And uh, as a sign of this decision, the Catholic Pope crowned the king to be the emperor of the revived Holy Roman Empire. 
Now, of course, it was not a Holy Roman Empire. It was neither holy nor Roman nor actually an empire, as Voltaire would later say in the 18th century. But it was a momentous decision because uh, the difference between being the king and being the emperor was that uh, the responsibility of the emperor was to protect Christianity from the threat of other religions, of course, Islam. So the emperor is the protector of faith in addition to being simply uh, the uh, top executive, so to say, the top political leader. Um, Charlemagne or Charles the Great became the first emperor of this revived Holy Roman Empire. Um, now let's talk about the church affairs. And um, uh, this is the image, um, this is the painting uh, of uh, the first Christian council uh, of Nicaea that took place in the year 325, which was convened by the Emperor Constantine. Uh, it is not yet the Middle Ages, but the council was very important in solidifying Christians, in hammering out the Christian creed uh, that would become the cornerstone of medieval Catholicism. Now, imagine uh, being a Christian in the fifth century of the Christian era. The empire is deteriorating. The barbarians took over uh, the administrative posts. The eastern part of the empire is going its own way. Um, there is social and political chaos. There is the vacuum of power. Um, people do not know how to defend themselves. In, in this situation of uh, social and political chaos, the only strong organizational force was actually the church. And remember, since the times of, of Constantine, the church had some kind of uh, right to decision-making, uh, not only in religious, but also in secular affairs. So since the fifth century, the church is growing stronger and stronger because of that, because people see in the church uh, the only strong power uh, that uh, would be able to defend them. And as a result, the church responds by developing a theocratic ideal that it is trying to develop over the centuries. What is theocracy? Theocracy is a political system in which religion and state are merged and religious leaders exercise political authority. Uh, let us briefly trace the development of uh, Catholic theocracy in the Middle Ages. First, Pope Leo I in the fifth century uh, formulated the doctrine of papal primacy, according to which the status and authority of the Bishop of Rome are higher than those of the leaders of other Christian churches. Theologically speaking, uh, this doctrine was based uh, on one of the passages from the Gospels when Jesus is asking Peter, who am I? And Peter responds, you are the Messiah. And Jesus says, on this stone, I will build my church. Uh, there is a play um, on words here because uh, the name Peter in Greek is Kephas and Kephas in Greek means the stone. So this passage was interpreted by Catholics to mean that Jesus entrusted to Peter a special place among the apostles. And since Peter was spreading Christianity in Rome, uh, the future popes of Catholicism saw themselves as the inheritors of Peter's legacy. So it is based on that theological justification that Pope Leo I proclaimed his doctrine of papal primacy uh, and his authority to be higher than the authority of the leaders of other Christian churches. Then the next step was made by Pope Gelasius, who died 
in the end of the fifth century. Pope Chalasius developed a theory about the relation of temporal to spiritual authority, according to which uh, it is the uh, task of the kings uh, to make sure that the empire is uh, in good condition in terms of material wealth and stability and peace with its neighbors. However, it is the task of spiritual leaders um, that uh, the subjects uh, of the church, the members of the church, would have uh, a good spiritual future. And since spirituality is more important than uh, materiality and temporality, therefore uh, the status of the spiritual leader is higher than the status of the temporal leader. This theory was uh, expressed in the uh, ceremony of coronation, when the Pope would crown the king, meaning that he would consent uh, to the king becoming the protector of the Christian faith. We already discussed the most important uh, episode uh, that took place in Europe in the year 800 when uh, the Catholic Pope um, crowned the King Charles the Great to be the Emperor of the revived Holy Roman Empire. The next step was made by Pope Gregory the Great, who died already in the 7th century, in the beginning of the 7th century. This Pope established the Popes as de facto rulers of Central Italy. So uh, since then, the popes were not only spiritual leaders, but they were also the rulers of their own, small though, um, kingdoms. Uh, what is left of this rulership is, now is the Vatican City, which is the city within the state. Uh, we could say that the Vatican City is a small theocracy within the Italian Republic. The next step was made by Pope John VIII, uh, already in the ninth century, who asserted not only uh, the right of the popes to crown the emperors, but also the right of the popes to choose the emperors. And finally, in the 11th century, Pope Gregory VII asserted the unqualified view of papal authority over everything and everyone. I would like to read one quotation as, as an illustration of that. In 1073, uh, pope Gregory VII was elected as the Pope, and in 1075 he issued uh, a document which, among other things, said, I quote, The Pope can be judged by no one. The Roman Church has never erred and never will err till the end of time. The Roman Church was founded by Christ alone. The Pope alone can depose and restore bishops. He alone can make new laws. He alone can set up new bishoprics and divine all ones. He alone can translate bishops. He alone can call general councils and authorize canon law. He alone can revise his judgments. His legates, even though in inferior orders, have precedence over all bishops. An appeal to the papal courts inhibits judgment by all inferior courts. A duly ordained pope is undoubtedly made a saint by the merits of Saint Peter. So here we have a reference to the same idea that uh, Saint Peter was a special among uh, other apostles and the popes as the um, successors of Peter as the inheritors of his special power uh, are also special and therefore uh, uh, are able to exercise this unusual and absolute authority uh, both within the church and outside the church. What are the implications uh, of this theocratic ideal in the Middle Ages? Now let me first say that uh, the Catholic Church never achieved full theocracy. Uh, the kings, of course, resisted. And uh, sometimes the church was winning the day. At other times, the kings were overpowering the church. As a result of this constant struggle, uh, the church and the kings agreed on some kind of separation 
uh, between their powers. And uh, that would be the very beginning of the modern principle of separation between church and state. Uh, but what are other characteristic features of medieval Catholicism? Um, features that are uh, directly linked, I would say, uh, to this uh, idea of absolute power. Those characteristic features uh, are as follows. Uh, the creation of the religious orders, the beginning of the Crusades, and the establishment of the medieval Inquisition. So first, let me uh, say a little bit about religious orders. It so happened uh, that Jesus Christ was never married, didn't have children, and therefore, uh, since its very beginning, uh, Christians believed that this is the best lifestyle. lifestyle. Again, this is a cultural thing. Uh, Moses had three wives. Muhammad had 11 wives after his first marriage. Um, so uh, for Jews and for Muslims, uh, the model lifestyle, the ideal lifestyle, uh, if they want to imitate the founders of their religion, is very different. But for Christians, uh, because uh, of how Jesus lived his own life, um, since its very beginning, um, for Christians, it was the best way to live your life, to uh, preserve chastity, and to devote all your time to the Lord. Uh, so this kind of ascetic attitude and ascetic lifestyle uh, started happening in the very first centuries of the Christian religion. In the third century, this ascetic lifestyle took the form of monasticism, when different ascetics uh, who were, uh, you know, doing their spiritual practices uh, on their own in the caves, for example, uh, in the desert caves, uh, they were grouped together to form a monastic community. And finally, in the 10th century, as a result of the Cluny reform, the first religious order was created. Uh, a religious order being a union of a series of monasteries with a strong hierarchical organization. Now, um, these orders were directly subordinated to the Pope. And obviously they would increase the power of Catholicism because monasteries would own a lot of land. Uh, those orders would be exempt from local taxes uh, because they directly uh, subordinated themselves to the Pope. And uh, the creation of orders uh, made the church stronger, not only uh, in terms of power, not only in terms of finances, but also in ideological terms, because uh, there have been different orders created for different purposes. In fact, religious orders were uh, analogous to um, what we nowadays call a non-for-profit organization. They were non-for-profit religious organizations that were created sometimes for ideological purposes. There were intellectual orders. There were orders that were created um, for uh, the purposes of helping people. There were even uh, military orders. For example, the Knights Templar created in the 12th century, um, disbanded in the 14th century, the order that was created in order to fight during the Crusades. The second characteristic feature of uh, medieval life uh, was the Inquisition. A medieval Inquisition was established in order to um, defend the church against the heresies. A heresy is a wrong Christian doctrine in the eyes of the majority. And um, the Christian church uh, suffered from various heresies back um, in the early days. Saint Augustine in the fourth century uh, was writing that um, there existed more than 80 different heresies. Medieval church was also suffering from the same, the same problem. And uh, in order to deal with that problem and to eliminate dissenters, and critics, medieval inquisition was established in the 12th century and in some countries 
uh, it existed until the 19th century in Spain, for example. And finally, the third major feature of uh, medieval church and life in the Middle Ages was, of course, the crusade. Uh, but not only one crusade, but a series of crusades. Uh, the first crusade took place in 1095. It was launched after Byzantine Emperor Alexius asked the Pope Urban II for help. And the Pope mobilized the army. And uh, the first crusade was successful, but uh, the rest of the crusades were not successful. But overall, the crusades lasted for uh, several centuries. Uh, they took a lot of uh, lives of Europeans. Um, as I said, they were not successful, there, but they were an attempt to um, defend Christian lands against uh, the Muslim invaders. Uh, they represented an attempt to reconquer Jerusalem. Unfortunately for Christians, they were not successful, but they were a very important part uh, of the medieval life, as I said, for several centuries, to say the least. Now, let's move on um, to the Catholic beliefs about heaven, hell, and the afterlife. And here we will be talking about St. Thomas Aquinas, one of the greatest Christian thinkers of all times, who lived in the 13th century. And we will discuss his views on heaven, hell, um, and purgatory uh, and the afterlife in general, um, his views based on his uh, magnum opus, Summa of Theology. In uh, his Summa of Theology, St. Thomas Aquinas distinguished between heaven, hell, and the purgatory. Now, heaven, hell are the concepts that are usually associated with Christianity, and we are going to talk about them uh, in um, my future lectures. But the purgatory is very specific to Catholicism. Only Catholics believe in the purgatory. Uh, neither Orthodox Christians nor Protestant Christians believe in the purgatory because the purgatory is not mentioned explicitly in the Bible. There are some references uh, in the Bible, uh, more specifically in the letters of the Apostle Paul, that are interpreted by Catholic theologians as references to the purgatory. But the Bible explicitly does not say anything about that section of the afterlife. So um, briefly speaking, heaven is for those Christians uh, who um, live the good life. Hell is for the sinners, uh, and purgatory is for the Christians uh, who are baptized and who are good people, but who have committed some sins uh, that um, prevent them from moving up to the heaven. Now, there are some interesting aspects of St. Thomas Aquinas's description of hell. There are some sections of hell that St. Thomas Aquinas describes and um, that uh, some of uh, my listeners and viewers may not be familiar with today. These are the limbo of the fathers or Abraham's bosom and the limbo of the children. According to classical Christianity, according to medieval Catholicism, if a person is not baptized or was not baptized, this person uh, is going to hell. So if a person was not baptized uh, because he lived before Jesus, or if the person is not baptized uh, for some reason, for example, a child who dies before baptism, uh, those kind of people cannot go to heaven. They necessarily go to hell uh, because of the original sin. According to the Christian theology, uh, we all are born with the original sin that is inherited from uh, the fall of Adam and Eve. Um, overall, Christianity is the religion that is based on four concepts. 
the concept of the original sin, the concept of the Trinity, the concept of bodily resurrection, and the concept of heaven and hell. We are going to talk more specifically about the original sin when we discuss Protestantism. Uh, let me just say uh, simply that uh, all people who are born with the original sin and who uh, were not baptized inevitably end up in hell. But among those people, uh, there are such individuals as Abraham, who is the pioneer of monotheism, or Moses, who is the founder of Judaism, or the Hebrew prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel. Now those people, uh, if we have a sense of justice, uh, should not end up in hell, in spite of the fact that they were living before Jesus. So what is the solution? The theological solution to this problem is the limbo of the fathers or Abraham's bosom. Uh, according to St. Thomas Aquinas' theology, those people uh, were in hell, but in a special section of a hell that is called the limbo of the fathers. And they were there uh, until um, Jesus was able to save them from that part of hell. Uh, Jesus was able to redeem the original sin, and when he descended into hell, he was able to liberate uh, all those um, Old Testament uh, prophets and uh, righteous people from uh, this uh, hellish existence. What about the children? The children who die without baptism, uh, according to Catholicism, should also end up in hell, but they are sinless. They did not commit any sins of their own. So what is uh, the resolution to this moral problem? The resolution in St. Thomas Aquinas' theology is the limbo of children. The limbo of children is this special section of hell uh, where those children are kept uh, simply because they have no uh, opportunity uh, to move up uh, in their afterlife. I'm not sure about the belief in limbo of the fathers, but I'm pretty sure that nowadays Catholics do not believe in the limbo of children any longer. Um, so as I said, uh, in terms of the purgatory, in Catholic theology, purgatory is an intermediate state between heaven and hell. And it is reserved for those who, after physical death, must undergo some purification before ascending into heaven. And now, uh, let me say some words about Dante Alighieri and his uh, famous poem, Divine Comedy. Uh, because Dante's Divine Comedy and his description of uh, various circles of hell and purgatory and heaven is based on St. Thomas Aquinas' theology. Uh, first, let us look at those two photographs, which I made in Florence when I visited Italy uh, quite a while ago. On, on the left photo, you see a very small street, which leads to the entrance of the small church where Dante was a parishioner. And a couple of houses down the street, uh, there is a house where Beatrice uh, lived. Beatrice, Dante's muse, whom he saw only a couple of times in his childhood, uh, whom he um, fell in love with, and who would become uh, one of the main characters in the Divine Comedy. It is because of Beatrice that Dante was able to first descend into hell, but then uh, ascend uh, various circles of hell and purgatory, and finally uh, following Beatrice um, to discover the um, various uh, levels of heaven. So Beatrice was not only his poetic muse, but also his spiritual guide in the poem. On the right photo, you, will, you see inside of the church where Dante was a parishioner. To my great surprise, when I was there, I discovered that this church is still alive and active. 
uh, services are still conducted there. And uh, it, it is a very small church, but it was very touching, very moving to actually stand um, in this church where Dante was standing about 700 years before that. So uh, Dante Alighieri completed his Divine Comedy in the year 1320, one year before his death. And in his description of heaven, hell, and purgatory, he draws on Aquinas' theology. I will briefly summarize for you uh, the structure of the three realms and we'll make some comments about some of them. So um, if you read the whole poem, uh, you will read about nine circles of hell or inferno. Um, which are followed by Lucifer, the fallen angel, which is part of the Catholic tradition. Uh, Lucifer, um, who is contained at the bottom of hell. Then Dante is moving up through uh, the nine rings of Mount Purgatory, uh, followed by the Garden of Eden crowning summit. By the way, uh, Dante's guide in hell is Virgil, a famous Roman poet, but Virgil was not baptized. So therefore, he cannot be the guide of Dante uh, in the upper levels uh, of uh, reality. So uh, we see the appearance of uh, Beatrice, who guides Dante um, up uh, to the celestial bodies of paradise. So after the nine rings of Mount Purgatory, we read about nine celestial bodies of paradise followed by the Empyrean containing the very essence of God. Some uh, comments about Purgatory. Uh, Dante is describing Purgatory as being based on the so-called seven deadly sins of the Catholic Church. Uh, the seven deadly sins are cleansed in purgatory and they correspond to a moral scheme of love perverted, subdivided into three groups. The first group, excessive love, which is lust, gluttony, and greed. The second group, deficient love, which is sloth. And the third group, malicious love, which is wrath, envy, and pride. Uh, the inferno that Dante is describing in his poem allegorically represents the Christian soul, seeing sin for what it is. So uh, Divine Comedy can be read uh, as a soulscape of Dante himself, who in the middle of his life when he is 35, finds himself in the place of sin uh, and he has to see the sin for what it is. Uh, in the poem, the three beasts stand for three types of sin, self-indulgence, the violent and the malicious. And uh, after going through hell, not only metaphorically, but literally speaking, Dante is able to uh, uplift his spirit and move up through purgatory to the celestial spheres. And he describes the celestial spheres of heaven uh, as based on the four cardinal virtues, which are prudence, fortitude, justice, and temperance, and three theological virtues, faith, hope, and love. And that concludes today's lecture. Thank you for watching. See you next time.